This episode of Retro Blasting is brought to you by Yojo Outlet and Museum Center. With over 6,500 vintage toy parts available on eBay every day, Yojo Outlet is the best source, not just for G.I. Joe parts, but for any toy line you can think of. We've been buying from them for years, and when we see that Cobra logo underneath the item, we know we're getting accurate descriptions and fast, reliable shipping. We weren't paid for this endorsement. We weren't given free stuff for this endorsement. We just like Yojo Outlet that much. Yojo Outlet is not a chop shop. They know vintage toys, and when it comes to vintage toys, knowing is the entire battle. Slave One with frozen Han Solo from Kenner's Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back collection. Action figures each sold separately. We are embarking on a new restoration project, and this one is really special. If you remember a few months back, we did the Imperial Troop Transporter, and it was owned by Tom Burgess, the founder of IGrewUpStarWars.com. Well, that wasn't a childhood original of his, but it gave us an opportunity to show how to fix the internal voice recorder of that vehicle, which is unique to that specific product. But Tom Burgess uh, is one of the many who regretfully sold his Star Wars toys after he became a teenager, or I guess he was in his 20s. Anyway, in the 90s, he sold his original Star Wars toys, and he's since regretted it. He's talked about it many times on various podcasts and interviews. Uh, but one vehicle that he had that miraculously didn't get away was his Slave One, his childhood Slave One. And we've never restored a Slave One uh, on Retro Blasting, so Tom called us up and he said, hey, my Slave One is still with me. Would you mind taking a look at it? Because Tom didn't have many vehicles growing up. Uh, he had the Troop Transporter, not the one that we restored, but he had another one, and he had the Slave One. Uh, his parents were more focused on buying figures. So when we saw his Slave One, he showed it to us in a photograph, we were like, yeah, sure, send it on, we can do something about it. Um, the funny thing is, is that Tom went to the nines before he even shipped this thing to us. And it shows how much love he has for Star Wars toys. And that's one of the reasons that we wanted to do this for him, was because Tom is the founder of IGrewUpStarWars.com. And if you haven't been there, it's an amazing repository of original childhood photographs from the original Star Wars era, from the late 70s and early 80s. All the photographs from our photo albums, us with Star Wars toys and Star Wars memorabilia. It's a fascinating website. Uh, he's done so much for the collecting community that we wanted to help Tom out. And we weren't the only ones that wanted to help Tom out. Seth Hastings at Plastic Galaxy, which is an awesome uh, storefront for just Star Wars memorabilia in Oklahoma, he wanted to help. And so Seth, when he found out that I was restoring a Slave One for Tom Burgess, he said, sign me up, and he sent me all the parts that we need to complete Tom Slave One. So big thanks to Seth Hastings and Plastic Galaxy for his generosity and contributions. If you haven't checked him out, he's also online and he trades a lot in the Facebook group, The Imperial Commissary. Um, but let's get started with Tom Slave One because the Slave One has some unique challenges and choices that we have to make. Um, before I begin though, I do want to thank Tom. He went to the nines cleaning this thing up. He loves Star Wars toys so much and you can tell I don't have to scrub one thing on this toy. Like he really knocked it out of the park. I mean, you're not going to see any toothbrushing or soaping or cleaning of this thing. I mean, it is immaculately clean, which is great because that means we can get to the interesting stuff. So let's get started. On the left, we have my Slave One, which I bought in 2004. And that's generally what the Slave One is supposed to look like. Mine is missing a few stickers. But the Slave One was a really cool ship from the Empire Strikes Back that came with the very first depiction of Han Solo and Carbonite. It was a little undersized, but it served its purpose for us when we were kids. The idea being that if you flip the ship to the, the back, you have a removable hatch panel, and then you have a boarding ramp that you sort of pop out, and then it slides down like this. And then you take someone like Boba Fett, and you have the carbonite, and you can load the carbonite into the back of Slave One. Um, Tom, this is my childhood Boba Fett. He will be overseeing personally the restoration of your Slave One. Hopefully that makes you feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, now, the Slave One had an interesting little gimmick uh, that was unique to the design of the ship. Uh, because the ship was shaped the way it was, uh, when it lands, it's, it lands like this. But that's not the way it flies, even though one would think it might fly you know, like this. It actually flies upright, like this. And to make that possible, 
there was a special ramp situation um, with the pilot seat. You could actually move this lever on the side to ramp the uh, pilot seat down so that you could then insert any figure you wanted to into this clip. And then you would move it back up and the pilot's head would pop up above the dashboard. Slave 1 also had a trigger mechanism for the wings. You held the trigger in to keep the wings in upright position and then when you got to cruising altitude you could let it go and they would go 90 degrees. And then you'd hold the trigger again and it would lock them in place. There were no battery features on the Slave 1, uh, which was nice, uh, so there's no motor to worry about corroding. Uh, but there are a few quirks about this vehicle that means we had to make some choices. So as you can see, Tom's ship is missing almost everything. It's missing the rear ramp, it's missing the uh, hatch compartment panel. Uh, it does have the seat with the clip, which is good. And it seems to work just fine. It's missing one of its stabilizer fins. And it's missing all of its stickers. Whatever stickers were left uh, probably weren't in good shape and then Tom obliterated them. Uh, and you know, rightfully so when he did his cleanup. And the cleanup job, Tom, that you did on this is impeccable. I don't even see any real discoloration uh, on this ship. It was clearly well taken care of and, and well loved, you know, other than the missing pieces. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is address this canopy because the canopy does have some light scratching on it. Um, it's not very foggy, which is good, but we want to try and clean that up as best we can. But the other reason uh, that I need to address the canopy is because unless the canopy comes off, I can't put the dashboard sticker of the pilot's cockpit back on. Uh, so first things first, we got to get this canopy off. Now, some people have said you use a screwdriver and you squeeze the tabs in like this to, to pull the canopy out, although it does run the risk of cracking the canopy. And I don't want to do that. I actually have found a better option. First, what I'll do is I'll just simply pull this fin off right here to get it out of my way. It's just pressure fit on there. Uh, so I'm just going to gently tug back and forth. And it's off. All right. Now, I don't know if you're going to be able to see this, but when I flip this, I flip it down, it's hard to see. There is a tab. You can actually get to the tabs of the window. Can you even see that? In there. Uh, the way you want to do this is you simply reach in with your finger uh, and grab those tabs and then press them out away from away from the body of the ship. And that keeps you from prying on it with a screwdriver, which would otherwise uh, run the risk of cracking it. And see how quickly and safely that came off with me just you know reaching up into the back side of the of the windscreen and then popping the tab upward with my finger was a lot better than prying on it with a screwdriver. So consider that when you're working on a Slave 1. I've also made the decision not to take the Slave 1 apart. Uh, as much as it would be advantageous to do so to place certain stickers and also get to certain components, as you can see, the rear guns are synchronous with a common rod that goes through the fuselage, and these are pressure fit onto the plastic rod that goes through the tail. I don't want to run the risk of breaking this this tail rod just to get the fuselage in half. So I'm going to leave the Slave 1 complete and, and, un, and, and assembled. Uh, I just think it's safer that way. And I think I can get to uh, certain elements without it. But let's get to the windscreen and get that done first. All right, so if you recall from a few of our other restorations, we have used the Novus method before to try and get rid of some scratches. Now, thankfully, Tom's windscreen doesn't have any major scratches. It just has some light minor scuffing. So what we're going to do is we're going to use some fine scratch remover first and then we're going to go in with a nice plastic clean and shine and see if that improves the situation. I'm going to make sure only to use it on the top. I'm not going to bother with the underside because the underside of a Slave 1 windscreen rarely sees any abuse. I guess the first thing I got to do is shake well. That was gross. So this is a microfiber cloth, so it's guaranteed not to scratch the windscreen. I 
I don't know if the results will be flawless, but if the Night Raven was any indication, they will definitely be superior to what it looks like right now. The amount of work that we go through to keep these mass-produced toys in good shape is a testament to our generation, I'm telling you. So after about two or three applications of Novus Number 2, I've made a significant improvement to Tom's canopy. The scratches have really been minimized. I think he's going to be really happy with it. And it's going to look great when it's displayed back on the ship. But I want to keep it separate for now for two reasons. One, I still have to deal with an issue with the internal mechanism of Tom's Slave 1. And two, I want to leave it off so that I can effectively sticker the cockpit. So let's get started on that counterweight problem. All right, so you see that rusty orange area in a cage on the right? That is actually a metal counterweight that allows the stabilizing fins of the Slave 1 to automatically rotate into place when you release the trigger. And as you can see, it started to rust on Tom's. Um, this is probably just due to the fact that it was exposed to some kind of latent humidity or moisture over the last 35 years. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to... Uh, not get in there and invasively try and remove it or anything like that because that would be pointless. It's, it's just a solid metal counterweight. But what we are going to do is try and uh, combat the rust a little bit. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a product called Hops 9. It is actually a, uh, it's a gun oil. Um, and the reason that I want to use uh, a gun oil is because uh, these oils are very sensitive uh, to metallurgy. They are not going to, you know, penetrate them or anything like that with any kind of chemical or solvent like some lubricants do. Uh, it's just the, the, the gentlest uh, lubricant um, for this kind of application, and I wanted to apply that to Tom's Slave 1. So I'm going to use a Q-tip, um, put this on the end of a Q-tip, and, you know, get that counterweight uh, de-rusted a little bit. Some nasty rust coming off that thing. We seem to have had a good effect on the counterweight. Getting some gun oil in there was effective in de-rusting it a little bit, and uh, hopefully it'll keep it uh, from oxidizing again. All right, now it's time to sticker Tom's ship. Now, a few years ago, I made mention of the fact that it was pointless to buy Star Wars reproduction stickers online because they weren't die cut. Uh, and I meant every word I said about it. Whereas with G.I. Joe and Transformers, there's really no point in jumping through hoops trying to make your own because such nice reproductions are available. Well, thankfully, that has changed. And there is an eBay seller named Zach Paris. It's Z-A-C Paris. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Z-A-C Paris online. And he's out of Australia. Um, could be a sheep. Uh, and they are doing amazing reproductions of the Star Wars vintage stickers, and they're doing them die cut. Uh, and I have... The ones for the Slave One right here, they come with just a wonderful instruction sheet just in case you don't have the original instructions left, which is really helpful. And then they come with the sheets themselves. Beautifully done, great paper, um, die cut as, as he said or as she said, um, and uh, you know very carefully numbered. So this is going to make Tom's ship look great. So we're going to get started doing this and I gotta be real careful because I wanna lay these down once and then be done with it. First one knocked out and we can put that glass back on. Starting to look like a Star Wars ship again. 
one of the things Zach Paris's instructions don't have uh, are just a visual guide for orienting some of these stickers. Some of them go one way, and so it, it makes sense, but some of them are just rectangles, and they might have a slight pattern variance to them, and so that's why I'm, I'm using the, uh, the box art of the actual Slave 1 from Kenner that I have for my Slave 1 as a reference, as well as my childhood, um, sorry, not my childhood, but my, my uh, personal Slave 1. Uh, if I'm in doubt. You really want to be careful anytime you're putting down stickers, whether they're vintage originals that you've resprayed. Uh, or whether they're, you know, reproductions uh, because you don't want to have to pull them up again uh, because you made a mistake. You want to lay them down once and then forget about it. The big advantage to die cut stickers is that you don't have to worry about cutting curves, which is a real problem, such as, you know, these perfect circles that became the engine, uh, the engine details for the Slave 1. It's almost impossible to cut a perfect circle unless you've got a special tool. So the, these die cut stickers are a real godsend. And this is the last sticker that's gonna go on Tom Slave 1 is the large uh, tail sticker that goes right over the main seam. Uh, as you can see from my Slave 1, this sticker is a real problem point um, for the toy. It tends to start to creep up and you know, a dog ear and things like that. And so it's good to, to get a replaced uh, sticker for Tom's ship. The idea, of course, being that you carefully lay this down, you match it up to the edges of the, of the panel, and then hopefully you don't have to do this again. I'm not really liking that placement yet, so I'm... get this right. It all comes down to this extension. Perfect. Now, I have left three stickers for Tom. This is the replacement uh, cargo panel, the access hatch panel for the back of the Slave 1, and it came with two very nice vintage stickers on it that are in great shape. Uh, so what I've done is I've left the three stickers because this is missing one sticker that would have gone right here where my thumb is, uh, and that's right here, number 41. I'm gonna leave these three stickers for Tom. Because if Tom decides that he would like to remove these two vintage stickers and put on all three of these as a sort of finishing touch for his childhood slave one, um, that's for him to do. So Tom, you get to make the last choice. Now let's put Tom's ship back together. Tom's ship is looking beautiful. All of the stickers have been put back on. Uh, it just looks great. Um, you know, Zach Paris does an extremely good job with uh, these sticker reproductions. And now that they're die cut, I can't recommend them enough. Uh, but now we get to move on to someone else whose skills uh, with Star Wars are impeccable, and that's Seth Hastings and Plastic Galaxy. Seth has kindly provided us with the missing uh, stabilizer fin, the uh, access ramp, the cargo hatch, and the carbonite block for Tom's childhood Slave One survivor. So let's get all these back on the ship. Uh, the notches uh, on the stabilizer fins face forward. Uh, on the Slave 1. This is Tom's childhood original, so we're going to slide that underneath and just very gently but firmly press it until it snaps. Snaps in, not snaps off. Now we'll get the one here donated by Plastic Galaxy. That 
It's on the other side, and so for the first time in 30 some odd years, Tom Slave 1 has both stabilizer fins. It's an exciting moment. Okay, so now we'll do access hatch, and you want to be careful with this piece because it has two guiding pins that are integrated into the mold. Obviously, these pins can break off and often do, so you just want to be careful when you're sliding them into uh, the grooves here. I'm going to start from the top and see if that works. Yes, so if you if you bring this ramp all the way up to the top, beyond the grooves, and then you line up the pins, you'll be able to slide the ramp in just fine. You don't have to worry about muscling it and possibly snapping them. So there is the access ramp. We're going to pop that down. There we go. Now that's in place. I'm going to put the carbonite block, the precious carbonite block that is missing from so many slave ones. We're going to put that in the cargo bay where it belongs. And now for the final touch. Looks pretty good to me. There it is. Tom's finished slave one. Tom's Childhood Slave 1 is back, and it looks amazing, due in no small part to Tom's obsessive cleaning of the fuselage, which really makes it pop. There was no discoloration when we got it, no dirt, no anything on it, and that really made our job easier. And it also helped that we had a generous partner in Seth Hastings from Plastic Galaxy. His generosity in bringing Tom's Childhood toy back through providing the lost parts was invaluable. And so this was really a joint effort between Plastic Galaxy and Retroblasting to give Tom his childhood surviving slave one back to him in immaculate condition. So thanks for watching this and we'll see you on the next one.